So by means of trying to wrap up the day and, and reflect, we thought we'd try and, and start with some main questions. And then I realized the questions are behind you, so we've printed them out. Um, and we're not going to ask everybody everything, but uh, th there was a discussion this morning uh, provoked by Mark, who's disappeared out of the room for a second. Uh, is the circular economy more than just a hype? So maybe I could ask um, Raphael and uh, Tim to reflect. Is circular economy just a hype? Raphael, would you like to start? And you can press the button. Well, I think in the presentations this morning there was a comment that uh, circular economy isn't necessarily, necessarily something that is new, but it's definitely a framework that is being consolidated and opening a dia dialogue that is changing the discussion within the companies and it really anchors into something more tangible for the C-suite, for the new business innovators in the companies. Um, it gives them an anchor, it gives us an anchor to work around, to have a dialogue, to have a common language. Um, and so in this sense, I'm very happy that we're talking about the circular economy, that all those ideas that we've already been promoting over the past years are now finding a way, let's say, in a constructed uh, framework that we can work on together. Okay. So Tim, you missed the discussion this morning or the presentation, but what's your take on... I'll this? give it my best guess. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I, th I think it's a really interesting question, isn't it? Is it just more than, than hype? I think there are some companies out there and some examples that are really great uh, examples of circular economy. I know Philips has one around uh, both lighting and around um, uh, MRI scanners, which are hugely expensive pieces of equipment, which uh, then you can take back and refurbish. The same with ships. I don't know Caterpillar do examples on their engines, which again, expensive, complex pieces of equipment. I think the challenge for the circular economy is we're almost going the wrong way in terms of products. You know, you look at an iPhone, it's getting more complicated. It's getting thinner, it's getting lighter. The components are becoming bonded together. They're not using conventional screws. They're, they're really, and this is not driven because Apple are trying to be mean, it's driven by customers. And, you know, customers are demanding thinner, lighter iPhones made of more exotic materials. One example, but we all want more from our products, and as we want more, the, the manufacturing techniques and, uh, and capabilities become more complex. So if, we were, if our products were getting simpler, then of course you would say, well, yeah, the circular economy is going to happen real soon, and of course you only have to go back 100 years and you can repair anything and, and, and circulate it. So I think that's the biggest challenge, not does it work fundamentally from a concept, because we know it does, and we, you know, uh, our, our grandparents would say, what is this circular economy? That's, you know, that's just a buzzword for what we've always done. But I think our challenge is how do we, we're probably missing a technology gap uh, from what we want and how we make it. Uh, and I think that's the thing we need to, to overcome. Okay, thanks, Tim. Anybody else like to but, uh, put their two penalties in there? You gave yours already this morning, Mark. Okay, otherwise we'll go into the next question. And the next question that uh, we have for you is, what are the largest barriers you see to circular economy being achieved in European society? So maybe if we could ask, um, yeah, Rasul, how about you give us a, an answer on that one, and then maybe Sergio. Short answer, I mean, um, yeah, largest barrier. I mean, again, as Tim mentioned, it's dependent on really the product we are producing and the, and, and the society and the community and the market we are actually promoting this uh, on the circular economy. I mean, um, what I learned is really one size shoes not fits all. Uh, we have to really rethink every time we are introducing or developing uh, products see that how the circular economy fits for that. A barrier could be uh, the manager, uh, internal and, and external. That external could be we didn't discuss anything about the government role this morning. I mean, how, which role government is playing in circular economy and, 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 and the sustainability of that. Some of these regulations that we are actually adopting on the sustainability environment and on social, sometimes actually done or pushed by the government to the company to do. So I think, Barrier could be the kind of um, 
product cell innovation and also partnership again I mean uh, we are working with you guys but again this is not only always we do so I, when I saw some of this uh, some of this uh, presentation this morning I mean for European society and also end users how we can engage the end users in this uh, discussion uh, amongst ourselves we can be agreed but the uh, end of the day f for our end users is maybe utilities municipalities and governments and for the vessel will be again navy and others so how we can engage this one in this discussion secular economic discussion Senator? well another barrier from my point of view is what is outside european countries because the let me say circular economics and improving environment and reducing the pollution and environmental impact needs investment and so definitely it brings to some uh, increase of cost versus the, the, the end user and the consumers if we have not the same kind of regulations and the same kind of approach also in the foreign markets it will be very very tight and tough Nancy, apart, apart from the, uh, the 10 uh, key messages from your book, what are the uh, most important competences uh, that companies should uh, actually adopt in order to get what Mark was talking about this morning, which is the more value and more environmental, uh, sorry, less environmental impact per dollar uh, of what we produce uh, to customers? Well, I think, personally, I think the uh, capability to experiment is one of the big ones that, uh, that businesses need to develop. Like, I think a lot of companies have knowledge and they, need to, and they know that they need to move to a more sustainable business or a more circular business. But I think the biggest challenge is, especially for large businesses, is developing that internal experimentation capability to be able to actually make that trans transition happen. The biggest one, I guess. What do you say, Mark? What, what have you seen in, in those kind of examples? Yeah, that's that's definitely an issue, I guess. So it's a bit far from the microphone. Um, it's actually not very difficult. You want it? It's about adding value without adding environmental load. So it requires the desire to uh, experiment and to indeed search creativity for such uh, solutions. And that doesn't need to be circular, but it, it's about uh, reaching the, the real problem and addressing the real goal. So uh, having affordable water is nothing circular about it, I think, but it's just a great idea. You have to do that. And to understand, I think this example very well shows it, that although the business case may be a bit difficult now, you actually created a lot of creativity, which could ultimately change uh, Danfoss completely, because it... You, you enter a whole new territory and a whole new market. So I think that's the, the core competence, be innovative and think out of the box and not follow everybody if they are going to close loops, but um, do something really wise. Thanks, Mark. Basu, how, how are you doing that inside uh, Gunfoss? So you, you have Gunfoss Lifelink, and how does that become part of uh, Gunfoss' activity? You're going to give the question to your colleagues. <laughs> yeah, they are from sustainability department, so. I have to be careful what I'm saying. No, I mean, again, uh, we always stating that sustainability is uh, company's DNA. So we have also, I mean, amongst ourselves to understand what's mean by this is our DNA. In which level? Are we talking about the R&D people? Or they say, yes, we adopted the, in our DNA, but what about the business development people? Are uh, they understand what's mean for the, our end users? Lifelink is actually created by kind of not only focusing on environmental impact but again as mentioned the four dimension of the financial social and economic and i think we also look at the oldest four dimensions not only just focusing on the environmental of course i think again my colleagues better to address this one from my point of view from my personal point of view really to understand <clears throat> what we are doing has a huge impact on the society regardless what so if we understand that to build the capacity internal, I think we are in the good shape. Otherwise, we will really lose the momentum at this now. Next question. Rafael. 
Are PSS solutions a help, a hindrance, or just an anomaly when considering the circular economy? You guys are in a transition at the moment. Does PSS get in the way? Does it, is it a help? Um, what's your position in your experience so far? Well, I was mentioning this morning also this progression of economic value where you go from the products to the service and then elevate the service to an experience and beyond. Um, I do think that service and service design is really key to the transition to the circular economy. So PSS is clearly a help to it. Um, we've seen a lot of um, industries that already shifted uh, to these service models, and a lot of them, a lot of others that are growing their capacity into it. Um, I would definitely say that PSS plays a key role in the circular economy. Okay. This may be a very product or industry specific uh, phenomenon. Tim, is it uh, irrelevant for a, a branch such as the toy branch and such as Lego to consider PSS? Are you more? Uh, fixed in the product uh, world, or is there also a, an opportunity to, to embrace a more servitized uh, strategy to, to even further leverage sustainability? Yeah, I think that was one of the questions before. I mean, what is our approach to, to providing, I guess, play as a service? It sounds uh, quite a brutal thing to do. I, 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 yeah, I think it's something that we need to really think more about. You know, I, I, I think the, the, the durability in, in our particular product means that we already do that consciously or unconsciously and we're, we're trying to promote that at a zero cost uh, you know going forward so we it's something we continually scratch our heads around and you know should we sell uh, plastic or play materials that then we to, uh, as Duplo and then take them back and form them into Lego system and then take them back and form them into Lego Technic as you go throughout the, the, the stages of your, your childhood etc. I think what is complex with toys particularly and, and quality toys is there's an emotional attachment to them uh, and that, that skews it totally. You know, you don't hear anyone, an extreme example maybe, but you don't hear anyone saying, uh, oh, I'm going to wear my Rolex for 10 years and I'm going to take it to bits and, and sell the parts off. You know, often people have an emotional attachment to physical things in a way that they don't have an emotional attachment to a pen or a computer mouse or whatever. So I think there are different cases. I, I know as myself, you know, try, being offered a, a toy as a service as a child, it's, my childhood is bound up in that, in that toy and it's still in my attic and I, I don't think I would give it to anyone. Um, so uh, that, that's a tricky one as well. Okay. I, I would just add something, um, especially as we talked about this idea of what do I do with my product when I don't need it anymore, when it's in a shape where it's not functioning anymore. There are a lot of opportunities that are untapped Right, and especially if we are talking about keeping the products, the materials, the components at their highest utility and value over time, this is where there is today a lot of gaps in a lot of markets for a lot of products and there the services will definitely be helping to create the vision that we are aspiring to. To fill some gaps, okay, thank you. Last question from my side, if you can come on. Oh. Is it conceivable that we will reach a new economic model where circular economy is the guiding principle, Nancy? Um, in short, I think the way it is set up now, uh, the answer would be no, because uh, the way we talk about circular economy now, I don't really think that it is an alternative for our cur current linear economy. I think we think don't think enough about organizations and the, the role of organizations, the way they make money at the moment, the way they're set up, the way their uh, accountability is arranged. Uh, the circular economy doesn't say anything about uh, corporate structure and, and shareholders and uh, how that all is set up. So I think it isn't yet an alternative in that sense. Uh, I think it's a more operational way of thinking about sustainability by looking at resources. I think we need a lot of uh, more clever people to rethink uh, the economy. There's some reports out, for instance from Cambridge as well, on rewiring the economy. You have the Capital Institute in the US, uh, think tank in that space. So I think a lot of people are trying to rethink it, but I think we need a combination of uh, the resources and the economic perspective. And although the word circular economy is there, it's not so much about the economy yet. 
any other comments from anyone else on the panel on that one? Mark? Yeah. Well, maybe you, you already expect. I, the first question is, is it desirable to, to have this? Um, and uh, I think we used to talk about various de eco design strategies, and I think this is one way of looking at the product. But it would actually kill a lot of creativity because you wouldn't be able to see other uh, things. So, I, I, as I said, it is appealing because the CEO may understand it, but um, it's beyond that. It is just to wake up people, to shake up people, but then the real thinking and experimenting uh, should start. So I would hope this is not um, going to be a new economic model based on this kind of rather narrow-minded view on, on, on what, how you can improve a product. Mm -hmm. Although in some products, of course, closing the loop is very obvious, mm -hmm. um, but in many products it's, it's, it's other things. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Does anybody from the audience have a question they'd like to pose to the panel? Or did you hear the glasses clinking outside mm -hmm. as well? then we'll leave it be. The reason, one of the reasons for having you here as the panel was to, uh, of course, make all the speakers stay till the end of the day. That worked. Uh, thank you for that. The other one was to uh, make sure that we had a, a, a chance to, to, to round up, but also so that we could hear now, uh, see you all, and give you a, a big round of applause and say many, many thanks for your great efforts for a, a really great day. So let's do that straight away. I'd like to thank all of you uh, very much for, for coming uh, today to, the, uh, to, to this day. It's the first time that we've done this type of an arrangement where we've had four days in succession uh, from our group. We've before had one day per year where the whole uh, uh, research and, and uh, industry collaboration activities have been depicted, but doing it in four days in succession has been a bit of an experiment, but we think uh, it's a lot of work, but we, we enjoy it a lot. So many thanks for, for coming and for joining us. And we'd like to just spend the uh, last minutes you have now on a sunny Friday afternoon, if you have any energy left, just to go out and say uh, cheers with us and uh, wish each other a good weekend. So many, many thanks for a great arrangement. See you next year, hopefully. Thank you.